death toll from Turkey and Syria earthquakes crosses 41,000. Indian raid of BBC continues for a second day. UN says Israel should be held accountable for home demolitions. Protesters call on Sweden to ban Quran burnings. Officer involved in Tyree Nichols' arrest, previously accused. Plan would tax rich to increase Social Security by $2,400 a year. And human rights defender Isa Amr is joining us for an exclusive interview. From Washington, D.C., this is the Muslim News on Muslim Network TV. Assalamu alaikum, I'm Hannah Zuberi. Our top story tonight. Turkish authorities say over 35,000 people have been killed in the country from last week's earthquakes. The Syrian government and the United Nations say more than 5,800 people have died in Syria from the quakes. Rescuers continue to pull survivors from the rubble. Two women were saved in Kahraman Maras, Turkey, more than 220 hours after the first quake. The UN is appealing for $397 million in aid to help 5 million Syrian survivors with shelter, health care, and food. The Turkish government is considering relocating hundreds of thousands of Syrians from 10 of the country's provinces after twin earthquakes last week. The disaster has caused tremendous destruction in northern Syria and southern Turkey, a region where Syrians fleeing civil war had found a new home. Syrian sources have told Middle East Eye the Syrian-Turkish Joint Committee will soon call for Syrians to relocate to different cities. The committee was created in 2019 on behalf of the Turkish Interior Ministry and the opposition Syrian National Coalition. Indian tax officers continued raiding BBC's office in the capital Delhi and other parts of India for a second day. Prime Minister Narendra Modi's government has characterized the raid as a survey. Officials seized financial documents and phones of BBC's employees. About 100 employees were present at the time of the raid and were told to go home. Three weeks ago, the British broadcaster aired its documentary highlighting Modi's role in the deadly 2002 pogrom of Muslims in Gujarat. Modi was the state's chief minister at the time. His current BJP government has banned the documentary from airing nationwide and also blocked clips on social media platforms as well as screenings at universities. The Press Club of India called the searches of BBC's offices a clear-cut case of vendetta. Amnesty International called them an affront to free speech. The Indian government has used tax raids in the past to intimidate journalists such as Rana Ayub and Amnesty International. UN experts on Monday urged the international community to take action to stop Israel's systematic and deliberate demolition of Palestinian homes. It called for an end to arbitrary displacement and forced expulsion of Palestinians in the occupied West Bank. In January alone, Israeli authorities reportedly demolished 132 Palestinian structures across 38 communities in the West Bank. Experts said that included 34 residential and 15 donor-funded structures. That represents a 135% increase compared to the same period in 2022 and includes five punitive demolitions. The UN said the systematic demolition of Palestinian homes, erection of illegal Israeli settlements, and systematic denial of building permits for Palestinians in the occupied West Bank amounts to domicide. The experts said such acts are illegal under international law and amount to 
into a war crime. Bringing more news stories after the break. Stay tuned and we'll be right back after these messages. Welcome back. Nearly 100 people stage a protest Sunday in the Swedish capital, Stockholm, demanding a ban on Quran burnings. It was organized by the Neos party and held outside of parliament. The head of the party, Mikael Juxel, said burning the Quran is a hate crime and has no place in democracies. He said Finland does not allow such actions. Yuxel called on the Swedish government to act accordingly and ban the burning of the Qur'an. Protesters also made effigies of Jimmy Ackeson, head of the far-right Sweden Democrats, who has defended Qur'an burning as freedom of expression, and that of Johan Pearson, the leader of the Liberal Party, who is demanding the closure of Islamic religious schools. Iranian political prisoner Farhad Maisami, whose photos after repeated hunger strikes have shocked the world, has been freed after more than four years in detention. Photos of the physician, along with his letter from Rajail Shahar prison in Kharaj, was published on social media on February 1st. They showed he had lost more than half his body weight. The 53-year-old has been in jail since 2018 for supporting women activists protesting against the mandatory Islamic dress code or hijab. According to my Sami's lawyer, he began his hunger strike on October 7th to protest recent government killings of demonstrators. In a letter from prison, my Sami wrote, I will still insist on my three demands of stopping the execution of protesters, releasing six political civil prisoners, and stopping forced hijab harassment. Many Iranian dissidents and foreign officials have expressed outrage and concern over his deteriorating health condition. The campaign to oust Sultan Ahmed al Jaber as president designate of the upcoming United Nations Climate Summit ratcheted up Monday. The United Arab Emirates will host the COP28 gathering in November. Its decision to appoint al Jaber to preside over climate negotiations has been widely condemned. The corporation al Jaber overseas announced record profits along with plans to expand and is one of the world's largest oil and gas producers. The Abu Dhabi National Oil Company, or ADNOC, raked in $802 million in net profit in 2022, up 33% from $604 million in 2021, Reuters reports. ADNOC is anticipating another record-breaking year with a projection of $850 million to $1 billion in net profit in 2023. That's largely because the drilling giant intends to ramp up extraction, including from so-called unconventional wells. Marta Schaff of Amnesty International said ADNOC's plans to increase fossil fuel production is entirely incompatible with Al Jaber's role as president-designate of COP28. A study published Monday finds the climate pledges of some of the world's largest companies are often highly misleading and lack transparency. They also fall short of what's necessary to avert catastrophic warming, it says. The Corporate Climate Responsibility Monitor closely examined the climate commitments of two dozen large global companies. It cast doubt on the viability of global emission reduction plans that depend on voluntary corporate action. Such companies often tout their net zero emission commitments and support for the Paris Climate Accord. But a closer look shows their plans are wholly insufficient and mired by ambiguity, says the report. The study was released by the New Climate Institute for Climate Policy and Global Sustainability, and Carbon Market Watch. Senators Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren led a group of lawmakers Monday in unveiling legislation that would increase Social Security benefits. The Social Security Expansion Act would put an additional 2400 in beneficiaries' pockets each year and ensure the program is fully funded through 2096. 
it would lift the cap on the maximum amount of income subject to Social Security payroll tax. The change would not raise taxes on the 93% of U.S. households that make $250,000 or less per year, according to an analysis by the Social Security Administration. Currently, annual earnings above $160,200 are not subject to the Social Security payroll tax. The legislation was introduced by Sanders and Warren in Senate and by Representative Jan Shinotsky and Vail Hoyley in the House. Congressional Republicans have threatened to cut Social Security and other key federal programs. A 21-year-old Michigan State University student posted a TikTok video sharing that Monday's shooting at the college wasn't the first shooting that she had lived through. Jackie Matthews said that she survived the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting more than 10 years ago. She described crouching in a corner with her classmates while a gunman fatally shot 20 first graders and six adults at the Newtown, Connecticut school. The Sandy Hook massacre was one of the deadliest mass shootings in U.S. history. Matthews hasn't fully recovered from the trauma of that shooting and says she has a full-blown PTSD fracture that flares up in stressful situations. That happened on Monday when a gunman opened fire at two Michigan State locations, killing at least three students and injuring about five people. Time reported a number of other students on campus were also survivors of a 2021 shooting at Oxford High School in Oxford Township, Michigan. Years before Memphis police officer Demetrius Haley fatally beat Tyra Nichols on January 7th, he was accused of taking part in the beating of an inmate at a county prison. The 2015 inmate assault was so disturbing that 34 other prisoners, the entire cell block, signed a letter to the corrections director. In it, the inmates urged an investigation into the beating due to some unprofessional officers at the Shelby County Prison. The letter asked how inmates can feel safe and secure when the staff members of the Shelby County Correctional Center are assaulting and threatening us. It was unclear whether Haley was disciplined or cleared of the assault. Haley was also amongst five officers who took part of the violent beatings of Nichols on January 7th. Nichols died three days after the beating. The College Board is pushing back against Florida's criticism and eventual ban of its Advanced Placement African American Studies course. The Washington Post reported the organization in charge of the SAT college entrance exam and the AP program took to Twitter on Saturday. It criticized Florida's Republican Governor Ron DeSantis and the state's Education Department. The College Board expressed regret for not immediately denouncing the Florida Department of Education slander, the Post reported. It also said remaining silent betrayed black scholars everywhere and those who have long toiled to build this remarkable field. AP African American Studies foregrounds a study of the diversity and black communities in the United States within the broader context of Africa and the African diaspora. It has drawn condemnation from both the political right and left. Florida's Department of Education spokeswoman Cassie Paleles earlier claimed the AP class lacks educational value and is contrary to Florida law. The course is currently offered as a pilot program in about 50 public high schools nationwide. DeSantis said last month the course taught components of a political agenda. He has called for defunding diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives in Florida's colleges and institutions. Coming up next after the break is our in-depth analysis segment with Isa Amer. So stay tuned and we'll be right back after these messages. Welcome back. The Israeli military assaulted UN-recognized human rights defender Isa Amr on the closed Shohada Street in occupied Hebron, an assault which was caught on camera. To discuss what actually happened, 
Isa Amr is joining Edward Ahmed Mitchell from Hebron. Over to you, Edward. Thank you, Hannah, and assalamu alaikum, everyone. May peace be upon you. I hope all of you are doing well and staying safe. Let's dive right into a very important uh, interview. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulullah. We're very happy now to welcome on a special guest, a Palestinian human rights defender, Isa Amro. He's joining us from Jerusalem to discuss something that you all may have seen, a video of him being attacked uh, by an Israeli occupation soldier in front of an American journalist. This incident was recorded, went viral, uh, and it's something that sadly happens to countless Palestinians, probably on a weekly, daily basis, but obviously it doesn't usually happen right in front of an American journalist filming it at the moment. We want to discuss what's happening on the ground with Issa, what happened to him, uh, and what the significance is for the Palestinian people and struggle in general. Uh, Issa, assalamu alaikum. Thank you for having us. Thank you for joining us. Uh, wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, thank you for having me. Absolutely. So, Isa, first, let's talk about, tell us a bit about yourself and the work that you do uh, in Palestine, for those who aren't familiar with your work. Uh, I'm a Palestinian human rights uh, defender. I try to increase awareness about uh, Israeli apartheid and Israeli human rights uh, violation. I try to give out cameras to the Palestinian families to document the Israeli human rights violation. And I lead tours in uh, West Bank and especially in Hebron, city to show the Israeli segregation, separation, apartheid, and I mainly uh, very active in Hebron. I work with the youth to empower them, with the women, to give them uh, uh, more uh, uh, tools to resist the Israeli occupation uh, peacefully. And I work a lot on in, uh, the international media and on the international solidarity movement to increase awareness about what is happening in uh, Palestine. All that being said, you would think that Israeli soldiers would know you're probably the last person they would want to lay a hand on, given your prominence in the work that you do. What happened in this incident? You were speaking to an American journalist. You were then Mr. Wright. Then you, just tell us what happened from your perspective. Uh, what happened to me is the case uh, of all Palestinians, women and children who are living under the Israeli occupation and apartheid and suffer from the Israeli uh, occupation forces brutality, and they suffer from Israeli settler violence. We, the Palestinians, really uh, suffer from the racism and the supremacy of the Israeli occupation. We try to do our best and to make a change. We don't give up. We continue fighting until we get our freedom and justice and equality. The Israeli occupation usually doesn't want anyone to uh, expose it's apartheid, it's occupation. They don't want us to reach the international media, the international uh, solidarity movement. They don't want us to reach the international community. They want to have a monopoly on the voices who are talking about the situation in uh, Palestine. I was trying to show the American journalist, he's a staff uh, worker with the New Yorker, and he's a famous, prominent uh, writer, playwright, film writer, books writer. So I took him in a tour in Hebron City. Hebron City is where the Ibrahimi Mosque exists. The Ibrahimi Mosque is the fourth mosque in Islam after Mecca, Medina, and Al-Aqsa Mosque. The fourth, the fourth mosque is Al Ibrahimi Mosque in uh, Al Khalil. The uh, pilgrims in the past used to come to Hebron after they go to Mecca, Medina, and Al Aqsa. So uh, it's very important for all Muslims, the uh, Hebron city, especially the, because of the presence of the Ibrahimi Mosque. So I was showing him the reality of the Israeli settlers who throw stones toward Palestinian uh, houses, Palestinian people who throw stones on the Palestinian and customers. I showed him uh, the checkpoints, I showed him the closed markets, closed streets. I showed him how streets are segregated, separated, how there are different streets, uh, one for the Jews and one for the Muslims, how Palestinians and Muslims as me had to walk on the cemetery, on the graveyard, not on the main road, so the main incident happened when I was talking to uh, Mr. Wright with another uh, Belgium uh, photographer about how I am not equal with him in my own city as a Palestinian and it's apartheid. Because I was walk walking in parallel with the, 
with a, a journalist who was working in our own Shohada Street, the main street in Hebron. And I was working in the graveyard because I'm not allowed as a Palestinian. The soldiers saw that, they got crazy, didn't want me to show this kind of reality to international uh, writers and to international audience. The soldiers tried to, do, to, to make uh, the photographer uh, delete the videos of what they found in the street. And they then, when I started documenting the soldier for to, uh, trying to force the, the photographer uh, to delete her video, the soldier moved toward me and asked me to delete the video. Then he arrested me and put me inside the, 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 the closed street, forced me to sit on a bench and hit me with a gun and then started intimidating me, scaring me. Then, uh, I, you know, suddenly the soldier, you know, uh, you know, you know, pushed me from here, you know, from my throat, you know, really, you know, pressed a lot, you know, hard and pushed me to the ground. I fall down. He continued, uh, he jumped on me, he kicked me again, he put his gun on my neck and he, he grabbed me, but other people took him away uh, from me. I, I was fainted, I became dizzy, terrified on, on the ground, cold, my hands, my arm, my legs, I, I was injured. I asked for ambulance for 40 minutes. I didn't get any uh, medical uh, treatment uh, in the contrary. The soldiers were rejoicing what happened to me with other settlers. Settlers were spatting on me. They were celebrating what happened to me. And they were really, you know, saying that let's arrest him. Let's uh, shoot him. Let's kill him. And uh, I got uh, help from other uh, Palestinian uh, friends who came to take me away from the soldiers' hands. Well, for first, let me just say we're, we're sorry that happened uh, to you. May Allah reward you if you're difficult to replace something better. And let's also note that this is another act of cowardice, right? You have these people heavily armed, helmets, guns, attacking journalists, uh, an utter cowardly act, right? If they were by themselves with all this weaponry, it'd be a completely different story. So this is a disgusting, cowardly act by cowards, number one. Number two, the irony here is that the Israeli government uh, declares itself the only democracy in the Middle East, and yet you're saying they were trying to force journalists to erase photographs that would have simply showed what you have to do on a daily basis, which is walk on the other side of the street, because you're not allowed to be on the main street, and so it's like a, a triply ironic, right? That you, you're you not allowed to do something. They don't want journalists to see that you're not allowed to do it. And they're willing to deprive a journalist of freedom of the press, really simply showing the reality of what's happening on the ground. I mean, it is remarkable uh, all around to actually see and hear for ourselves. Now, what has the reaction been to this incident? What have you heard from, from journalists, from Palestinian community, from, from others around the world? What kind of reaction are you getting? Uh, I was lucky that I was with a famous uh, American journalist. Uh, the video got a lot of attention on the social media and on the mainstream media. I was doing interviews all day and I was telling them, you know, it's not the first time. I got five stitches, three stitches. My nose was broken. I was hit all over my body as a Palestinian. I see this kind of videos every day in East Jerusalem, in Ramallah, in, in Hebron, all over West Bank. You know, we see soldiers we live it as as you say it's not something unique it's not rare that you know soldiers are that, that violent with palestinians without any accountability you know that the the attention we got was really uh, important to teach the international community what's going on on the ground millions of retweets and shares and likes for this video and people denounced the incident even the israeli government had to announce that they arrested the soldier and suspended him uh, from uh, service for 10 days and to, you know and but you know being there the Israeli uh, uh, security minister uh, backed up the soldier and he described me as an anarchist who's who's trying to provoke the Israeli soldiers I say that I don't provoke the Israeli soldiers uh, in the contrary they are provoked by, by my existence by my presence you know they are provoked that I'm talking about their apartheid their their occupation their violence they don't want really anybody to talk about what they are doing and make it reach the international media because, you know, Israel is playing that it's a democracy, that this country is really about human rights, this country is civilized, which for me, it's not. It's an occupation, it's an apartheid, it's a country which is violating the international law, the country which doesn't respect or protect human rights defender as me. I was arrested two months ago, I was attacked in the last three months 
many many times by settlers and and soldiers not only me many other palestinian human rights defender and even there are they announced six palestinian human rights organizations as terrorist organization they are going after human rights defenders they are going after human rights organizations why first they don't want documentation second they don't want advocacy and awareness about what is happening on the ground third they want to have a monopoly on what's going uh, out from the, uh, the this region and they don't want any Palestinian voices to reach our Muslims brothers and sisters all over the world and to reach all the other people who are really supporting the Palestinian cause and who are showing any solidarity with the Palestinians. Yeah, and Issa, I think you you know this, but I'll say it if you don't, that there is uh, incredible support in the UMA uh, for the Palestinian people, including here in the United States. Uh, we know that some governments have turned their back uh, on the Palestinian people, but that is not what the broader Muslim community uh, is doing. Uh, and so know that for sure, that here in America, we are still firmly uh, with you all and firmly supportive of your right to freedom uh, and peace and justice. So that being said, what do you think will come of this? Because We've seen videos of horrific things being done before, kids blown up, Palestinian kids blown up on, on a beach, an American Palestinian Christian journalist shot in the head by an Israeli sniper, uh, you know, the bombing of an entire building uh, used by journalists, the Associated Press, uh, Associated Press, the BBC and other mainstream media outlets in the Gaza Strip. We've seen horrible things on video before, but nothing really changes about the Israeli government's behavior. Do you think that the documentation of these things will over time change the way the world deals with the Israeli government or changes the situation on the ground? Uh, you know, let me say and be very honest. Now the Israeli government is saying the truth. It's the real face of the Israeli occupation and apartheid. In the past, they were trying to play politics. Now they are so clear. They openly saying apartheid. They openly saying no rights for the Palestinians. So they embarrass their supporters in the United States and all over the world. So we as Palestinians, we are fighting the Israeli occupation uh, 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 as part of our duty. It's our duty to do so, to defend our rights and our basic human rights and basic political rights. And we are really, you know, doing an, uh, an, 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 a big smooth, you know, because we are defending ourselves. We are def defending our uh, identity. They want to remove our identity. They want us to coexist with the occupation and accept to be second class citizen in our own uh, country. But we are resisting, we are trying to protect our uh, narrative, to protect our identity. So we are in protection and so on. This is on one hand. The other hand, I see a lot of people are changing. We, I see a lot of people are supportive of the Palestinian cause. I see more and more people understand what's going on. I see more and more people really, really you know, stealing the, the, the occupation, it's apartheid. Look to a human rights watch, how it described uh, Israel as an apartheid state. Look to Amnesty International, the two big, biggest human rights organization described Israel as an apartheid state, and even an Israeli human rights organization, Beit Salem, described Israel as an apartheid state. In the other hand, you know, we see a conditional, you know, have voices in in the United States from the main establishment calling for conditional aid to Israel. This is what we are talking as Palestinians. We want the American people to put pressure on the, their own government to stop and, and apply support to the Israeli government and stop the $3.8 billion, which is a kind of contribution to the, uh, you know, to the occupation and apartheid. Me personally, I started my activism. I learned from my activism from Mr. King, from the civil rights movement. So the Americans understand what racism means. The Americans understand what, what inequality means. When we talk, we want freedom. The Americans know what are, talking, what, uh, what are we talking about. So we want them to raise their voices. We want them to act according to their principles and their morals, not according to the interest of uh, uh, someone here or someone there. But we, we are the people. We, we can make the change. We have to be united, we'll not lose the hope until we make this occupation accountable according to the international law and even according to the American principles and morals. Yeah, I think the, the thing that, that many people noted is that the American people are generally fair people, uh, uh, very fair people, right? Many of them just don't know what the Palestinian people are experiencing. They don't see it. And so that's what makes your work so important. 
um, you know, every little video, uh, you know, gets to new people and more people and breaks down misconceptions in their mind about what is actually happening on the ground there. So we thank you, Issa, for your work in documenting these uh, human rights abuses. Uh, please know you all are being heard and seen and recognized by more people here in the United States and around the world, uh, inside and outside the Muslim community, of course. So I want to thank you so much for joining us today and, and sharing your story. And we look forward to having you back, hopefully share some positive news about progress being made in liberating and freeing the Palestinian people. Inshallah, God willing. Thank you so much. Inshallah. Isa. Inshallah. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Hannah, we will send it back to you. Thank you so much, Edward and Isa, for sharing the truth. That's all from our Washington studios tonight. Thank you for tuning in. You can find previous episodes and more on our YouTube or Facebook. For more content, keep watching Muslim Network TV or visit muslimnetwork.tv. Assalamu alaikum and good night.